Welcome. I'm Dr. CJ Campbell, and this is Coffee with Dr. CJ. This is a weekly series that we've been running here through Cleveland Clinic. I'm Dr. CJ Campbell. I'm a family doc and sports medicine physician at Cleveland Clinic Canada. We started this series about a month ago for several reasons. One is to keep us all together during these dark, difficult times. And the second is to answer some of the questions that have popped up that seem to be more specific to COVID. Um, so we're gonna go through a, a number of topics today related to my next guest uh, and diet. But before we do that, I really wanted to give a shout out to Cleveland Clinic Canada to also thank uh, Cleveland Clinic administration and staff and to Mike Kessel, our CEO. Hello, Mike, I know you're out there in TV land somewhere, video land. Uh, thank you to Mike Kessel for keeping us all going at this time and supporting the whole staff, which has really been incredible. So uh, thank you very much. So my next guest uh, is Jacqueline Pritchard. And before I introduce her, I'm just going to uh, say that uh, we're gonna talk about diet today. We're gonna talk about some food challenges and eating challenges. And I think some of us, me included, uh, perhaps are eating a little more uh, than we should and maybe at times things that we shouldn't be eating. So I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Pritchard. And Jacqueline is a dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Canada. She's one of our superstars. She's a fabulous uh, dietitian, uh, born and raised in Burlington. I'm gonna check my cheat, note, cheat notes here because she completed an applied sciences degree in food and nutrition at Ryerson University. Ryerson University. She specializes in cognitive approaches to weight management, to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, digestive disease, pre and postnatal nutrition, and she's got 13 years of experience doing this and leading interdisciplinary weight management programs. She does have a private practice and she practices what she preaches, I'm glad to say. She uh, loves to run, uh, she loves to eat, she loves to cook, and uh, she loves her family. So welcome very much. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, Jacqueline, today. So welcome. Um, there's you. many questions. I've we have many questions today, but first, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm holding up, holding up nicely in this challenging time. So thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. That's great. Well, we have a whole list of questions. Some people have already sent in questions, so I've included them here. And I've added a few of my own as well. So we'll talk about a number of things today, such as uh, immune response, uh, does food help our immunity? Are there special foods that we can eat that will help our immunity? Um, someone wrote in and said that they have mindless eating and can we give tips around that? Someone asked about the quarantine 15, which we'll have fun with. Why are we all baking is another question. I know I'm baking a ton. Mm -hmm. How uh, do I use all those canned goods in my shelves? And uh, do best dates really matter? And how long can we keep that food in our freezer? So let's start at the beginning. And uh, Jacqueline, there, is, uh, there are many articles on uh, immunity and diet. And uh, if I take mega doses of vitamin C, is that going to help my immunity? Yeah, what no, this is, a, this, is a bit, this is a big one, right? We're seeing it all over the place from social media to newspaper and, and various magazine articles. So let's get this one out on the table right away. There is no way of actually boosting your immunity. Okay, so we see that buzzword everywhere and let's just debunk that right away. Your immune system is a really complicated system um, and there is no amount of orange juice or emer emergency supplement powder or kale juice that can actually boost your immune system. Uh, what you need to do is support your immune system. So this really complicated system can certainly be supported and nutrition is one of those things that can help it. So there's no magic pill. 
No magic pill. I no magic that. pill. If there was and a magic pill, I'd be off on some island, you know, living the life, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so healthy diet uh, is obviously uh, what we're looking for. And uh, you put up this slide as as the Canada Food Guidelines has some basic uh, information on it. Maybe you could speak to this uh, this plate of food here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are certainly some key nutrients, um, micro and macronutrients that are important for su supporting our immune system. And really most of them fall on this plate. And when we look at trying to educate people around healthy eating, um, Canada's food got, can, sorry, the government of Canada came out with this food guide last year, um, really helping to simplify Canadians eating behaviors by using this plate, right? So really by highlighting if you can eat 50% of your entree or your plate as vegetables and fruit, if you can choose a good protein source and a good whole grain option or starch option, you're really going to be hitting a lot of those immune supporting nutrients, which would include zinc, selenium, protein, uh, vitamin C, uh, another big one, and dietary fiber. Because after all, a lot of our immune system exists in our gut. And so supporting our gut with that good nutrition is going to help to support the immune system. So a, a good healthy diet, obviously, exactly. Uh, exactly. is, is going to support your immunity. No magic pill. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> we, uh, someone also uh, wrote in about mindless eating, and I love this uh, picture. You're not hungry, you're bored. Shut the mm, door. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what would you say about mindless eating, and, and uh, how can you help us? Uh, out there. Yeah, so I think we've seen, I've seen this picture and similar ones all over social media in people trying to uh, cut down on mindless eating. And I think we're in this unique time, which is bringing on, um, you know, eating behaviors that are, are thought to be disconnected really to when we really need physical, we physically need food versus maybe when we want it or we're just bored to have it. So one of the best things you can do if you feel like you're doing some mindless eating and really what is mindless eating is really disconnected eating. You're not paying attention to what you're having. You're not um, enjoying and, and really finding pleasure in what you're having. Um, and you're not connected to actually your stomach and when you're actually feeling physical hunger. So the first thing that I'd recommend for mindless eating is really what I call front loading your day with more food, uh, which really means eating more earlier in the day, right? So starting off with a strong breakfast, uh, subsequent meals, you know, lunch, snacks, um, being good protein options, nice high fiber options, that's going to help you reduce your chances of mindlessly snacking because you're going to be able to say, I'm not physically hungry for it. Um, again, stopping and when you go and grab for food, am I really hungry for this? Do I feel that kind of need um, based on a physiological uh, sign? Or is this just, you know, me wanting something because I'm bored or because I'm passing through the kitchen or something? So really stopping yourself and these little cues like this, this sign here is helping people to stop and connect to some of those things. <laughs> Uh, another big one is just not having food so accessible, right? So, um, you know, if you're working in your kitchen or if your kitchen is open concept to maybe your office space, if you have bowls of nuts on the table or if you have a cookie jar or if you have, you know, various tempting foods on the counter, that's going to be harder to control some mindless eating. So tuck those things away, right? Put them in cupboards, put them on shelves that are maybe harder to get to, and that will help you to, again, you know, check in with yourself before you go and have a snack. I and always I think, like the express. Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I yeah, so like I think the it, expression. It's... I always like the expression 
breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, supper like a pauper as well in terms of loading. You said loading the start of your day. And the other thing I thought was really interesting, you talked about routine as well, is get into a routine around your eating. And it's interesting that all the webinars that we've done have talked about the importance of routine in yeah. terms of, we did one a few weeks ago on exercise and fitness and the importance of having a routine in your exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. Or even last week when we talked about parenting, about routine in your parenting, about, you know, when you do your schoolwork, when you do your, your studies, when you go for your exercise and so forth. So, so great tips and great advice there. Now, uh, I found this interesting because in my day, I remember they talked about the freshman 15, which was... Uh, an expression used for those first year university students that would leave home, go into uh, residence, and uh, before the end of the year, they had all gained uh, 15 pounds, or that equals about 6.8 kilograms. And apparently since 1985, with this freshman 15, they started measuring uh, the weight gains of university students. And on average, apparently it's like one to six kilograms per, uh, per year in that first year of university, which is up to 15 pounds. Now I've been reading about this quarantine 15, and maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, so just like you said, it's very similar to that, that frosh 15 that people gain in the first year of university. So what we're seeing is, right, in this change of environment that we're in now, right, working from home, um, not being able to go out, uh, we're seeing us turn to a little bit more, you know, what we might call emotional eating, um, boredom eating, stress eating, um, as a result of, you know, just less to do, right? So um, with this change of environment, as it ties back into mindless eating, it's really important as you, as you commented, to have a routine around your eating to help stop mindless eating um, and, and adding these extra calories that might contribute to weight gain. Now, I'm also very cautious in that, you know, emotional eating, uh, it's, it's one of those things, it's also very normal for us to right, turn to food emotionally. So I think as we, you know, we wanna focus on fueling ourselves well and, and eating foods that make us feel good, but also understanding that this is a really trying time for a lot of people. So also being a little bit compassionate and understanding to ourselves and not beating ourselves up for slipping off a little bit and enjoying some indulgences every so often, but also being really aware that if you've got a good routine, if you've got some structure to your day, if you've got, again, good nutritiously dense foods that are gonna fill you up, the chances of emotional eating or stress eating or boredom eating will be likely a little bit less. So those other strategies will really help manage this potential weight gain as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent ideas and tips there. Uh, so we talk about stress eating, as you just mentioned, what about stress baking? Everyone's baking. And actually I put up a, <laughs> a picture of my, we call it the funky bread. Uh, <laughs> and on the right there, uh, I did make a, a lovely loaf of bread the other day. It came up with these horns somehow. And uh, it happened to be my neighbor's birthday, who's a Taurus. So he was, uh, he was given this gift of uh, bread with, uh, with the two horns on it there. <laughs> but what are your comments around everyone baking right now? Yeah, well, the, I mean, again, this kind of goes with where we're, our, our schedule's changed a little bit, right? And, and I know, um, you know, I've, I've cut my day off at four or five o'clock and I've done some fresh pasta making and bread making. And this week was some chili with cornbread topping, which I normally wouldn't do when I was back in, in the office due to commuting time and stuff, right? So yeah, we're seeing ourselves turn to some of this because it's a, you know, we've got a little bit more time for it. Um, it is also a very therapeutic thing for people, right? And for me, I love cooking and baking as a way of just kind of disconnecting a little bit and allowing my 
myself to use my hands to do something else. Um, it's a great thing to do with children, right? So I love bringing my kids into the kitchen and help, you know, having them help me bake, learn a new skill. Um, we're also looking at things that they'll transfer into their lives as you know, valuable skills for them to have too. So again, we're seeing more of this and we have to be watchful of, yes, how often you know, we're doing it, how much we're having of it. Um, but remembering, again, it is a very therapeutic thing. Um, it's something at this time that we can have a bit of a sense of control over as well um, and comfort in. So there is some good things to come out of stress baking. Um, and it's also showing, it's helping us show people that we care, right? Where, uh, you know, you hear of a lot of door drops these days with people, you know, taking baked goods to their neighbors, uh, maybe elderly folks that aren't able to get out as much. Um, so it's also a way of, you know, showing some compassion and care for people as well. Those are uh, great tips. And also, I, I love what you said about caring. And, and I think, um, through this difficult time, uh, COVID's really provided an opportunity for people to step up and rise up and show their best selves. Um, the, I, I find a lot of people are doing this. I know Marnie and Owen, hello Marnie and Owen, if you're on, <laughs> uh, are across the street, bring lovely little goodies over, bags of granola, bags of uh, some banana bread. Uh, and I've been doing, as you can see, <laughs> loaves of for the neighbors with horns on them so uh, so it is a, a an interesting time um, uh, if we reflect on on the times um, speaking of baking mm -hmm. uh, the other thing uh, I asked you and this was a, this was a dr. CJ question is it's very difficult with all my baking and with everyone's baking to find flour on the shelves and yeast on the shelves it, it's all gone uh, I understand that the mills are churning flour out like crazy. So there seems to be a problem in getting the flour from the, from the mill uh, onto the shelves. Um, and you came up with some great ideas. So perhaps you could speak to that in this yeah. next uh, slide. Absolutely. And I've, I've tried a couple of these substitutes now to see how they'll substitute. And, you know, it's, it's maybe not your fresh white loaf of bread, but there are some great alternatives here. So um, we have, you know, included some of the measurements because um, flour and flour alternatives will weigh um, differently and have different densities and um, water contents to them. So you do have to make sure that you are adjusting to, uh, to the flour amount to the type that you're using. Um, so take note of these because that might be helpful in your next uh, uh, in your next substitution. So a lot of these flowers are out on the market for people who might have allergies and intolerances to things. Uh, certainly almond and coconut flour are really popular with our ketogenic uh, dieters right now. Quinoa and rice flour for our uh, people living with, uh, with celiac disease um, and oat flour as well. So a lot of these can absolutely be found. And I, again, I logged on to the Loblaws website this morning and I found all of them. So they're all there, they're all available as good alternatives. Some of them are actually higher in fiber as well. So something like an oat flour, quinoa flour, they're gonna yield a little bit more dietary fiber and nutritional quality. So they're a nice alternative if you're looking for something with a little bit more nutrient density. So these are, yeah, these are really great alternatives uh, for your baking needs. So I've also uh, posted at the end, which I'll leave up uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, a website um, with these flour substitutes uh, listed on them as well. So speaking of yeast, um, let's, uh, why don't you go through and explain these, these substitutions? This is a little trickier for me, I think. Yeah, so there's a couple things out there that you can do to look for, to, to get a yeast substitute. So um, the first thing that I would recommend, and this is what I did to go out and find some yeast, is going to some of the local convenience stores or little corner stores in your area. Um, maybe Loblaws or Longos or Sobeys isn't carrying it, but some of the little guys out there, your little independent grocers might have it. So always you know rely on them as a way of supporting them too just to see if there's some there because i did find some um, but if all else fails um, baking soda and lemon juice or acid um, would be another alternative so using something like vinegar or 
or um, buttermilk would also be an acid. Um, mixed together in a one-to-one -one ratio can also be a substitute for yeast. So if you're looking for a tablespoon of yeast in your recipe, or that's what it calls for, you can combine uh, baking soda with lemon juice and use a tablespoon of that as well. So if you combine a tablespoon of each lemon juice baking soda and take a tablespoon total to substitute in, that will work the same way as it would yeast. The other alternative that I've found, I haven't used this one myself, but I've actually heard some raving reviews about it, is potato yeast. And potato yeast is where you take a, a, a potato, a white potato uh, or Yukon gold, you peel it and boil it, and you take some of that starchy water, once you've turned it into kind of a mashed potato texture, take about a cup of that starchy water, you mix it with some flour and sugar, you let it sit for a period of time, and after that, it'll froth up and work exactly like yeast as well. Again, you use the same amount of that potato yeast as you would normal yeast, tablespoon for tablespoon. So we should put that on the site as well, because I can just imagine this mess that I'm creating as you were discussing that. So I need very, uh, uh, I, I'm a pretty good cook, uh, yeah. but um, you know, my motto is if you can read, you can cook, uh, which means I need a very good recipe. So uh, the other thing you mentioned about getting some of these ingredients in some of these small stores. And the only thing I would say is we're talking about COVID-19 as well. So make sure that you're practicing uh, physical distancing. I'm not uh, a big fan of social distancing because I think we're all social and we need that right now, but we should be practicing physical distancing in um, that six foot radius and so forth. Uh, so keep that in mind. And uh, also when you're bringing all these ingredients into the house, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen more and more and uh, Sanjay Gupta and all the different people on uh, television talking about bringing these groceries into your house. Uh, is there a risk with that? Uh, and uh, should we be uh, dunking everything in Purell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and there's been a little bit of some mixed uh, mixed opinions and thoughts around this, right? So I think in the weeks past, um, we've we've thought, you know what, it's good to be cautious. Let's wipe things down. No, we don't have to be bleaching things and heavily pure uh, purelling them, but certainly wiping things down, wiping surfaces down, because various surfaces may carry the virus. However, yesterday something new came out that I did read around the fact the surfaces probably can't um, carry the virus very well. And so there's probably less of a need to actually be wiping those surfaces. Um, and I think for some people, and the psychologists would probably agree on this too, some, for some people this creates more stress, right, around everything, is having to wipe everything down and where, where do I put it and how long does it have to sit for? That can create some real angst for people. So, um, I mean, what I've been doing is just, you know, getting a wet J cloth with a little bit of, you know, light soap on it and just wiping things down and, and putting them into my shelf, not fretting too much about uh, what you're bringing into the house. And so some further information about that, just because there have been some questions around that, is that the COVID virus actually lasts about, on average, 3.6 hours on various surfaces. Now it lasts longer on non-porous uh, surfaces like mm -hmm. stainless steel, plastic and so forth and it lasts less time on porous surfaces like uh, paper or clothing because the water from the virus gets absorbed into the materials and it desiccates or falls apart or becomes not so um, uh, healthy. Um, they do say that on some surfaces it can last for several days, but the information is that the virus particle number goes down so greatly over those days that it's very unlikely for it to actually cause any damage. But certainly the key is hand washing. So if someone, if we have a lot of Uber fans out there that are uh, Ubering everything in these days, the question is, should we worry about these packages coming into the house or the, the person, uh, it, it's more you worry about the person delivering it and making sure that you're carefully hand washing. Certainly if you have some wipes, you can wipe the package down or have one person deal with that, put the things in 
out of sight and then wash your hands. Be careful with touching your face and so forth. So just some, some other information around that as well. Uh, but the key is, is hand washing as, as everyone has said repeatedly. Uh, but that is really great information. I purposely left this up for a bit so people could write those lovely little recipes down. Although I'm going to need more help with that potato yeast and we'll go to the site <laughs> on that. Uh, so I opened the pantry door here. I'm sitting, uh, as you can see, in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> and um, I see a lot of things. Uh, I'm blessed that I have things in my pantry. I appreciate that. Um, but I have cans of tuna, I've got all these dried beans, a recipe a, a year ago called for some dried beans and now I have the left of the, the, la uh, the last of these dried beans in a bag in my cupboard. Uh, what does one do with all these things? And maybe now is the time to start cleaning out that pantry and using uh, these goodies. So over to you, Jacqueline. Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of, you know, lots of recipes that we can find for these for these dried goods, including, uh, you know, canned tuna, salmon, as well as beans. So, I mean, I think we always think when we think about beans, we think about some of those traditional recipes, right? We think about soups and stews and bean salads, and those are all great things. Um, what I love about those is actually uh, they make a lot, right? So they make a batch of something usually where you have six servings. That's nice for being able to freeze things and, and pull out e for easy meals. But yeah, I'm, I think I'm challenging people at this time to really think outside the box and think about things like using lentils for like a bolognese kind of sauce for your pasta. Uh, thinking about patties, making, you know, veg uh, you know vegetarian uh, bean uh, patties, bean burgers or falafels. Uh, using, you know, instead of using uh, chicken in a stir fry, using some edamame beans or some chickpeas or something as an alternative thinking about where would I put chicken or where would I put beef or fish? Why don't I substitute beans instead? Um, it's also a great way of trying to get people to eat a little bit more plant-based if they're looking to try to lean on that type of um, eating pattern as well. And there's some great desserts. So going back to baking, you know, bean brownies, chickpea cookies, uh, there's lots of different recipes out there that you can rely on some of these beans in your baking as well, uh, which, is, which is just really fun and, and different too. So yeah, think outside the box in, in using some of these things. Um, and same goes for things like canned tuna and salmon. Uh, this week I made tuna patties for my kids and I wasn't sure if they'd be a hit, but they were a huge hit. And now I have 12 frozen in the freezer and I can pull them out and heat them up really quickly. Um, again, flaking tuna in a pasta sauce, using tuna in tacos instead of ground meat or something like that. So, you know, really thinking, um, you know, along the lines of where would I normally put chicken? Could I put, uh, you know, a, a bean as an alternative in there um, is a great way of thinking. Great ideas. Um, I know uh, I have a monster pile of cookbooks here at home. Mm -hmm. but what I've taken to do, uh, to doing is to actually go to Google and uh, I see that you did put up some different uh, recommendations with all recipes and so forth. And I found that actually be really health, healthy and uh, easy to do. And I pick out the five star recipes and uh, go with those because I am a recipe person, uh, unfortunately, but uh, it, it seems to work for me. So, so that's a great idea. And those I think are some of your favorite uh, sites that you mentioned there. Yeah, yeah. These ones specifically are, are ingredient searches, right? So if you're looking, if you've got a can of chickpeas, um, some celery and tomato sauce, uh, you can go on to some of these websites and put in the, re the ingredients that you have and it'll populate some recipes that will allow you to use those ingredients that you have on hand. So yes, you can do a Google search as well, but some of these are great for really streamlining some of those recipes. Excellent. And uh, that brings us to <laughs> the best before dates. Yes. And um, I, I hate to admit it, but if I open my cupboard door, um, I certainly have some cans in there that uh, have dates that uh, are slightly older than they should be. And 
uh, different products uh, that are certainly older than they should be. And I guess my question to you is, how much do we pay attention to that? Are there certain things that maybe we have a little leeway on um, and others that need it's time to, uh, to go in the, the green bin or the garbage? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's unfortunate, right? A lot of our food waste comes from people probably throwing things out a little bit sooner than they have to, right? And if you're like my husband, he looks in the fridge and he sees best before yesterday and he's like, oh, this is needs to go out, it's done, it's bad. Um, and it's it's really not, right? So the, the most common thing that we see on our foods, um, you know, chicken, yogurts, uh, eggs, as well as our dried goods is called the best before date. And the best before date really is what assures the highest amount of uh, freshness, uh, quality, and taste, uh, right? So when we're looking at the best before date, it doesn't mean the day after it's bad and it can't be used. Most of these best before dates can actually go longer than what the date actually shows. Um, and this is where we have to use a bit of our own discretion as to whether we're actually going to consume it or not. Um, so a lot of canned goods, the best before date, and we've got one, um, you know, uh, there, and I brought one along here. Right, so we've got the best before date usually on the top there, hold right? It up. And that hold it up right to the uh, right, right to that. There. Oh, oh, there, there we got it. Great. Yeah, right, so there's it. our best before date on a canned good. Um, and typically canned goods can be used for a couple of years after their best before date is, right? So something in a can, um, a lot of packaged dried goods, things like pasta and that kind of thing as well, can actually stay well beyond their best before date in your, in your cupboard if they're still closed up. Now, essentially, when you open them, that's when the best before date might change, of course, right? Because freshness will become compromised. Um, and, and that's when you'll want to kind of keep your eye on it a little bit more. But something like a, a tomato sauce or a ketchup or certainly salad dressings, once they've been opened up, many of them are good in your fridge for a very long period of time, um, up to a year for some condiments. Um, and again, you might have to kind of take a look at it, right? If there's a tomato sauce that's been in the fridge for uh, six months and you see some, you know, some mold growing on it, yes, you'll want to get rid of that right away. Or if the smell has been off, those things you'll want to get rid of right away. But like I said, just because the best before date is, you know, a week or six months later, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get rid of it um, there's probably still lots of use that you can get out of it at that time and when you say freeze if getting close to use by date I know you mentioned some things do you also mean like can things you can freeze you absolutely can yeah so okay. once you've taken something out of the can so chickpeas I've, I've okay so you've before. opened you've opened the can and then you're gonna, okay yeah yeah, yeah. It's best I couldn't to imagine putting all these <laughs> best <laughs> date cans in my freezer so okay so they're opened and then you you can keep them going from there yes yes yeah and even things like milk and eggs cheese i'll grate up my cheese and put it in a ziploc bag that's great for putting into omelets or something like that so all of those things if you're getting close to that date especially with fresh things that are in your fridge um yeah just move them to the to the freezer um that's the best thing you can do to still be able to use them. Okay. And speaking of freezers, <laughs> looks a little like my freezer downstairs. <laughs> um, the, uh, how long can you leave stuff in the freezer? And actually, I'm very excited. We had a question from our participants today. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's no name, but it does say with respect to surface contamination, our frozen vegetables, safer than fresh vegetables and you can speak to that and then i will give uh, my thoughts on that yeah so um in terms of like a fresh versus a frozen vegetable in terms of again right now there's no evidence to suggest that anything fresh can necessarily carry the virus right so i know people are being very cautious about using things like lettuce or um, you know, any fresh vegetables, things that have very smooth surfaces, again, just taking a cloth and kind of wiping it down. Um, and, and anything, you know, even if you're using greens, you still wanna be washing those in your salad spinner or in a little bit of water anyways. Um, but that should be all you have to do as you normally would clean them 
under any regular circumstance, right? Because we all wash our fresh yeah. fruit and vegetables before COVID, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. So carry on with those practices um, mm -hmm. as, as we would um, have before. And in terms of frozen stuff, yes, um, you know, uh, freezing when the you know, freezer or the vegetable or fruit gets to a certain temperature, um, which would be a freezing temperature, it will not allow the virus to grow. So anything that is frozen uh, would, would carry, I can say with fairly good certainty, no risk to it. Um, and, and yeah. Okay. Uh, and just going back one step before we get to these frozen foods, because we had another brilliant question here. Yeah. And it says, does it matter if canned goods are dented or rusted at the edges? Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I would, I would say the can, the dented, the dented um, question just first, um, if a can is dented, um, I would discard it or uh, not purchase it from the grocery store. Um, it has been shown that once a can is dented, there could be things from the can that might leak into the food product potentially. Um, so those ones I would say to get rid of. Um, if it's rusted on the edges, I would probably, I would say it's still safe to consume. Um, if you open it up and you find rust on the inside, then I would consider discarding it. But if it's just yeah. on the lip, kind of like out here or something, I would say open it up, take a good look inside and still use it. Mm -hmm. As long as that rust hasn't obviously created an opening Correct. into the can or yes. broken into the can. Yes. Good. Yeah. So then I'm going to take you back to this uh, lovely uh, picture of my basement uh, freezer. It is. Mm -hmm. a <laughs> um, and how long we can keep, uh, keep various frozen foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the most part, we can keep frozen foods for a very long time. I mean, some would argue up to a year, but I would say three to six months is a good um, is a good range to keep frozen foods. Um, and the biggest reason for that, and the reason for the varying from three to six months, um, has a lot to do with um, depending on how much water is in, uh, like let's say fruits and vegetables versus chicken. Um, the, there's they're not going to go bad. They might just get some freezer burn on them, right? So you've probably pulled out that stuff from the bottom of your freezer that's got ice crystals all over it. So things that have more water to them will um, gain those crystals a lot faster than something that has less water in it. So at the end of the day, it's still safe to consume. It might just throw off the texture of whatever it is that you're specifically cooking. And I have a question. I have someone that does bake bread. Congratulations, little one. Uh, and freezes the bread and it often gets freezer burn. Yeah. Uh, and even when it hasn't been there for very long. And do you have any uh, tips on how to wrap the bread? Uh, I'm all ears. Uh, mm -hmm. Wrap the bread so it doesn't get this freezer burn. Is mm -hmm. there a special way to do that that you're aware of? Yeah, yeah. So one of the best things you can do for bread specifically and for cheese actually, uh, cheese actually as well, is to wrap it in like parchment or wax paper first. So take the bread, wrap it nicely that way, then put it in plastic wrap and then put it into an airtight container or a freezer bag with a tight seal and let out all that air inside. So that's gonna help to preserve it the longest rather than just kind of loosely putting into a plastic bag and putting it right into the freezer. Um, nicely packaging it with some parchment paper will have it last a lot longer. Uh, what about tin foil? Tin Wrapping foil. it in tin foil or would parchment be better? Parchment yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure tin foil would work the same way. Um, I've only ever read the suggestion of doing it with parchment paper, but yeah, tin foil would probably work the same way. Anything just to keep the air out is essentially what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other question that we had, uh, how about best before dates for meat products? Mm. Uh, and they say, should we do the same thing? Which I would say probably yes, but we'll get your mm. thoughts on uh, in terms of visual inspection and, and smell and odor so forth. Yeah, I think with like poultry and meat products, um, color and smell um, can really help us to identify whether that product is safe to consume or not. So you're right on all meat products. We do have a packaged on date and we have a best before date, right? So those are the two dates that are important to note on meat products. 
And like I said, the best before date is when it's going to be the freshest, uh, when it's likely to not have spoiled yet up to that date. But if it's a day or two after that, as I said, this is where it gets a little bit loosey goosey in terms of your discretion is used, right? If you open up the package and it doesn't smell, which really a lot of poultry shouldn't contain, they shouldn't have any smell when you open it. So if there is any smell, that's when I would consider discarding it. Um, a lot of people have probably noticed, you know, their chicken get a little bit slippery or slimy looking. That's when I would, that's when I would get rid of it. Um, so if it smells, looks, um, or uh, certainly visually looks off, uh, get rid of it without a doubt. Last question I have here. Um, isn't this a good time to completely clear out and use foods stored a long time in freezers and clean those freezers? Yes, it's a very good time yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yes, it's a great time to do that, right? And I think I've done that to free up more space, if anything. But yeah, it's a good time to go through some of those things and, and do a bit of a purge. It's also a good time to clean your basement. Yeah. Don't forget. <laughs> and your closets. <laughs> and your closet. And, and take that bag to the thrift store, although we have to be careful with, with all the physical yeah. distancing and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Um, so here are some of the resources that you've kindly passed on uh, to us, Jacqueline, including the one on flower substitutes that we talked to um, and uh, some of the recipe sites. Um, this is your contact uh, information and uh, you do private uh, consulting. You also <laughs> consult through the executive health program at uh, Cleveland Clinic. We are very grateful for you uh, to come join us today. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, our, next week, we have Dr. Razmi joining us. He's a psychiatrist at Cleveland Clinic Canada, and he has private practice as well. Uh, and interestingly, next week is Mental Health uh, Awareness Week as well. So it's quite appropriate to uh, have him speak and uh, give us some tips, advice, and, and counseling during this difficult time. So, any last thoughts before uh, we uh, say goodbye to our uh, lovely audience here today? Any other uh, tips or suggestions during this crazy time? Yeah, thanks for having me, Kathy, and, and to the clinic for having me. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's a really great and unique opportunity, like we've pointed out um, in this discussion today, to you know harness some some skills maybe that we don't typically use while we're in the workplace, right? And um, it's a great time to get into the kitchen and do some cooking and use some different ingredients and uh, and some some skill set, right? Make some bread, make some fresh pasta, make something you haven't made before because uh, it's just a it's a it's a special time for that. It, we've got a lot of challenges and we can certainly see some goodness to come out of it. And maybe it's related to, you know, putting ourselves, uh, you know, doing some self care for ourselves and eating some good food. So I thank you again. It's been great. And I want to give fi finally one uh, uh, birthday shout out to our own sweet Amanda, who I think is on the line today, uh, one of the nurses at our clinic. So uh, with that, I uh, say stay safe, wash your hands, and practice physical distancing. Bye for now. Bye.